This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 104, recorded on October 22nd, 2010. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and it's time for TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. And today, we have a complete TWIV crew, beginning with Dixon de Pommier. Hey, Vince. Right here in my office. Yep. A rare appearance. He's back. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> and he's bad. <laughs> now, where have you been? Um, all over the city, basically. I've been uh, on a sort of a, a quest for um, a publicist who's uh, been hired by the book company that produced my book. That's right. Your book came out last week. My book week. came out last week. It changed my life. Good. So now I'm responsible for going on all kinds of crazy shows. Are you and, doing uh, book tours? They don't do book tours anymore, Vince. They sort of uh, get you on radio talk shows and stuff like Rebecca that. Rebecca Skloot does book tours. Well, um, I'm she not at that level. paid a lot of money to I'm do them, I'm not at that too. level. I'm, I'm not. That's my next book. <laughs> Let's bring in the rest of the TWIV crew. Let's go up to Western Massachusetts, where the leaves are past their peak, and bring Alan Dove in. Yes, indeed. They uh, they actually just are. You could still come up here and and see some good leaves, but uh, they're they're mostly on my lawn rather than <laughs> looking pretty in the trees. I was up in Portland, Maine, this week, and they are past their peak up there. Yeah, yeah. A few hours north of you, and let's go down to to North Central Florida, where there are no leaves, <laughs> and bring in Rich Condit. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. There are leaves there, but they always Actually, stay I'm looking trees. at lots of leaves, and they're uh, yeah. quite green. Yeah, they, you know, they somewhere green. in November, about half of them sort of turn brown and fall off the trees. That's our equivalent of fall. <laughs> and the rest stay on. Yep. Well, I didn't know so, you had that change of leaf. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You guys it's, got a lot of pine trees, though, right? Uh, a lot of pine trees and a lot of uh, – we got these oaks that kind of are right. sort of semi-evergreen. Not really, That's but right. – Live oaks. Hard to, yes, hmm. right. Today we have two great stories, but before we move into them, I want to say something about what I did last night, and that is I went to what's called a Harvey Lecture, and this is a series of lectures every year which take place at Rockefeller University. There's a society called the Harvey Society. Named after? William Harvey. Who? Discovered circulation. Indeed. Or at yeah. least put two and two together. He cut a lot of because Leonardo and da Vinci knew a lot about circulation. Oh yeah. In fact, he actually designed. Well, we will get to that later. He didn't. Well, he didn't start the Harvey Society. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he started the Leonardo <laughs> Society. <laughs> Founded in 1905, which is well after uh, Harvey died. Just named after him. It's a cool series. Um, there is a standing committee every year. They pick speakers. In fact, I did this back in '91. It's very cool. And the, yep. the thing is, you. The speaker can invite people to come to dinner beforehand. There's right, very, and as as I recall with you, the goal was to get the speaker drunk before yes, the talk. Precisely. They, tried. they have a nice dinner in a wonderful library room right next to the auditorium, and yeah. it's wonderful food and, and wine, and right. they try, but you know, most of the speakers are so <laughs> nervous you can barely eat. True. Anyway, last night's speaker was Peter Palazzi, and he invited me to dinner, and uh, I also gave the appreciation, which is after the... The talk, someone gets up and says a few words. And uh, there were the reason I'm bringing this up, it's a very cool tradition in New York. So a lot of people come from all over. Hundreds of people come. And, and afterwards, we went down to the bar, and Peter bought everyone drinks. Uh, but there were a lot of TWIV fans there. Cool. A number of people came up, mostly younger people, <laughs> came up and said, Hey, I love TWIV. How about that? So to all of them who are listening, nice to see you last night. Here, here. Keep Great. on listening. And the, the, what I also found out was that there are a lot of people who don't know about it, but when told about it, are fascinated. Cool. So we have to keep spreading the word. Great. The more people did you wear, who listen. Did you wear a tux? I wore a tux, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't worn this particular tux or any tux for Maybe since the last Gordon, uh, the last Harvey lecture, 1991. Wow. And it still fit. <laughs> no, I had to have it let out. <laughs> it didn't fit. The waist was too tight. Right. Um, 
Oh, well. Sorry, I interrupted you. The more people that listen, or the, the more, more people, people that listen, the uh, well, I don't know, the, the better off we are. Maybe we can get advertising support someday again. Yep. So actually, tell your friends. I, mm -hmm. in uh, in almost in anticipation of one of our stories, I went out to dinner with a group of students last night, and uh, one of them sat down uh, across from me, and I'd never met her before, and she uh, introduced herself as a rabid Twib fan. Rabbit, which was which was which was very cool. <laughs> um, Rabbit, that's a that's a viral uh, uh, reference, I presume. Right. <laughs> we need to give her um, some uh, an <clears throat> monoclonal antibody therapy. Absolutely. <laughs> not only that, but she's a, an amateur beekeeper. Oh, oh wow. cool! So we had a big conversation about bees. It was wow, great. Wow! Wow! Well, wow! Wow! Speaking of bees, um, a paper came out not too long ago on colony collapse disorder, and that's our main story. But not too long ago, we had an email from Kelly who wrote, I know I'm behind on this, but would you please do a complete broadcast of the suspected cause of colony collapse disorder in honeybees? Mm -hmm. I am a beekeeper and would like to know more. Please don't be afraid to dumb it down. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Are you afraid, Dick? <laughs> me? What? Me worry? <laughs> By the way, we I, never I fear to, dumbing it down. No, thank you, Alan. I meant to add my two cents to Vince's support for the Harvey Society, though, because while I was a postdoc there, I actually got a privileged uh, invitation to join it, and I have been a member ever since. Yeah, so since cool. 1967, cool. it's a great, it's a great society. Well, it's just very nice that you have this very. Um... Civilized dinner. Yep, but the publications that come out also and, are fantastic. Oh yeah, it comes out in a book as well. It's a cool thing. So yep. I will put a link to the website and uh, you check that out. Cool. Getting back to the bees, though, yeah, colony yeah. collapse. We talked about a lot. Uh, in fact, Twiv sixty four it was one of our ten virology stories of two thousand and nine. Twiv forty six and Twiv forty nine in two thousand and nine. We did various stories. So let's get up to speed on this last one, which I think is very cool. And, uh, well, to bring everyone up to speed, colony collapse disorder is a recently recognized disorder of honeybees. Um, it could be older than we think, but 2006-ish, it began to be recognized, maybe nationally, but um, maybe there are some beekeepers out there who knew it was going on beforehand. It basically, it basically involves a rapid loss of adult worker bees they, they disappear go out and they don't come back yeah so the the colony or the hive basically disappears there's a queen and a few workers left and everyone else is gone and no one knows what's going on so this first um began in the united states i believe in colonies. and we know they didn't get discount airline tickets like no that. <laughs> no they didn't all go on jet blue and just get stuck right. on the tarmac so uh there have been a number of studies to try and figure out what is going on here? Um, let's see which I'm going to start with them. I have a nice paper here on a descriptive study. This is a PLOS One paper published in uh, 2009, and they looked at colonies that had CCD in the U.S., and they looked at 61 different variables like physiology of the bee, pathogen loads, pesticide level, pesticide levels. I didn't find anything that correlated consistently with the disease. Right. By the way, Vince, can you mm -hmm. even mention why we even care whether bees survive or not? Right. It's not just about yeah. honey. No, not at all, in fact. I mean, you were in Maine. One of their main exports is uh, blueberries. Mm -hmm. Their blueberries will not exist without bees to pollinate. So bees are primary pollinators for lots of crops. Right. And they move around the country, and in fact, they store them in Texas and Montana. And it might be a traveling uh, uh, issue of, of moving these colonies from one place to the next. It's a mm, it's yeah. a multi, multi, multi million dollar industry. So let me get this clear: there are farmed honeybees. Are there wild honeybees as well? There are, and in fact, the wild honeybees uh, we're worried about them hybridizing with the in introduced Africanized honeybee. That's the mm -hmm. African honeybee has been introduced by mistake into the new world. It's been moving up through Central America into the United States, and they do hybridize with the Apis mellifluor uh, species, which is the domesticated honeybee. Mm -hmm. And uh, it produces a very aggressive hybrid, which uh, beekeepers really can't keep because they yeah. get stung too much. So if you took away the farmed honeybees, the wild ones, wouldn't be sufficient to pollinate? No. In Why fact, is that? They well, because nature <laughs> regulates these populations quite nicely by uh, predation and uh, diseases. In fact, right, and we we have a lot more plants than uh, 
than would normally be pollinated. And they that's right. You take a colony of bees and you put them next to, to blueberries and they, they start pollinating. But if they're in okay. the wild, they'll pollinate anything. Okay. So this first study then basically found that nothing varied. They found lots of pathogens, lots, yeah. lots of mites and, mites and viruses and other pathogens. But none of them, and they also found toxins, you know. But they never found anything that consistently went with the disease, all right? So that was right. 2009. Uh, then in another paper which we discussed, uh, coming from Ian Lipkin's group, a metagenomic survey of microbes in a honeybeak CCD. Mm -hmm. What they did there was to take, um, they extracted RNA from hives, both with and without the disease, and royal jelly, you know what royal jelly is, Dixon? I do. What is? I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, it's the food that they feed to certain bees to turn them into queens. Who feeds it to them? The workers? The workers. Where do they get it? They, it's, Shop right? It's, <laughs> probably. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, no, it's, a, it's actually a, uh, a way that the colony has of surviving through tough okay. times. So they took these samples. They make RNA. Okay, so this is just RNA, not DNA. Right. They make RNA, right? And then they convert it to DNA and they sequence it. They do this deep, massive sequencing, and they get rid of all the host sequences by computer programs, and they see what's left. And they find a bunch of pathogens of all sorts. But in the paper, what they concluded was that one virus called Israeli acute paralysis virus of bees. Right. They said this is the strongest correlation. Right. But it wasn't in every diseased um, hive, no, colony. What do nope. you call these things? Colonies. Colonies. Yep. So there were some diseased without this virus. So it's not a perfect correlation. But this was a paper that sent an, a message, and then people can go out and check it, see if this is right. Right. All right. <clears throat> and Israeli acute paralysis virus is a coronavirus. Oh. It does paralyze the bees, so that would make sense, right? They would yep. get infected and fly off. But you would think that some of them would remain in the hive right? let the sick ones go away and they don't stay there actually my uh this uh amateur beekeeper that mm -hmm. i met um last night megan by the way yeah said that sick bees do leave the hive mm -hmm. which is very interesting you know huh. uh uh she she indicated that you know there's this is a very unusual circumstance, as if all these sick bees would leave the hive. That, that, that's weird. But individual sick bees mm. do kind of, for the, apparently, I mean, this is anthropomorphizing it, but uh, apparently for the sake of the hive, leave the hive. Well, according to the Lipkin paper, they say bees infected with, um, what is it? Is this the acute? Varroa this mites. The varroa mites. Ah, Yeah. Uh, there you find dead bees in the hive. Mm -hmm. These colony deaths are marked by dead bees in the hive in contrast to CCD. So that's why they ruled out the mite, the varroa mite. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the mite could be a vector, too. Exactly. Because yeah. they do it bite. Yeah. And there are some of these other viruses that they've found uh, associated with the bees that are carried, in fact, by the mm -hmm. mites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or there could be a synergistic effect of uh, maybe you're okay if you have the virus or the mite, but you're not okay if you have both. Here, here. You know, right. it's, it's interesting because there's a similar thing going on at a higher level with frogs or amphibians in general. There's a, an enormous collapse of the number of species of amphibians throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And they've tried to pin it down to one thing or another. And the, the best correlation they can come up with is that the immune system of frogs is being compromised, yeah. probably by too much UVB radiation coming through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they are weakened, and then they respond poorly to other normal non-pathogens become pathogens. Is that because we're depleting the ozone layer? It's partially true. Yeah, that's like right. With chlorofluorocarbons, Exactly right? right. A little information on Israeli acute paralysis virus. Dixon, where do you think it was discovered? Uh, <laughs> am I supposed to be the foil for these jokes or what? <laughs> hey, I'm giving you an easy question. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> okay, okay. I won't ask you easy questions. Uh, how many nucleotides long is the genome? Oh, Dixon? stop it. <laughs> All right. It was discovered in Israel in 2004. The bees present with shivering wings. Huh. I like that. They present as if they're going to the, to the emergency room. <laughs> Shivering wings, paralysis, and then die outside the hive. So that's why they thought this was a good candidate. But other viruses are known to infect honeybees like sac brood virus, deformed wing virus, acute bee paralysis virus, 
Cashmere B virus and the Black Queen Cell virus. I like that name. The Black Queen Black Cell Queen. virus. That's a great name for a rock group, right? Or, or a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, um, or a terrorist group. <laughs> after the Lipkin paper, people started to address this question, and apparently it didn't pan out that this uh, no. coronavirus was involved. There were diseased colonies without mm. um, the virus in them, which is a problem. A problem. There were some infections without disease. So, right. um, and not all the colonies suffered from this not either. Not all the colonies had it as well. Now, given I, that the different groups are finding different pathogens and some mm-hmm. find some associations and some don't, right. um, I, to me it sounds like maybe there's, there's something going on, some environmental insult, kind of like with the frogs perhaps, yes, where yes, you've, yes. you've got a depressed the immune systems and Mm -hmm. so they're catching whatever they're catching and they're just not clearing infections and so yeah whatever you look for you may find some correlation because they're just being killed by things that they would have been clearing otherwise here here and that would have i mean well taken that some of these papers they say that this thing came on relatively rapidly and so there's got to be some it's like an epidemic of some sort like like an epidemic but as you know from talking about xmrv we, where we're getting different viruses now as well, maybe complicated. Yeah, maybe. and how much of that, how much of the apparent epidemic is just that we're paying more attention to it? Sure. Yeah, this would be a yeah. good open question for our listeners to design a an ironclad epidemiologic approach to this that would ultimately result in the pinning down of what's actually causing it. Well, don't we have to fulfill Koch's postulates? Yes and no. I mean, you can get the epidemiology done, but in the end, you have to prove it biologically. This is and true. That's where Koch comes in. That's where there's no animal models. Then. <laughs> well, with the bees, you can infect bees. Oh, of course. Of course. We don't have the ethical that's consideration. Right. No, we don't. People. No, we don't. Um, anyway, the, the most recent paper, which is the, the reason we're doing this, it's called Iridovirus and Microsporidian Linked to Honeybee Colony Decline. This is from PLOS One, just published recently. And they review the issues with acute uh, Israeli paralysis virus uh, very well. They say one study demonstrated that that virus was in the U.S. long before the outbreaks of colony collapse. So that's a problem, I suppose. Although if there's a secondary thing, then that would be okay. Um, So they say the role of IAPV in colony collapse remains inconclusive. And apparently the Army... um, well, that's part of the other story. Now, in this paper, they use a different approach. The Lipkin lab did sequencing of total RNA. And here they actually they take total protein from uh, their samples, bees, for example, and digest them with proteases and do mass spectroscopy. Wow. Right? And they call this an unbiased approach. Now, my view, I don't know what you guys think, but that's because they're looking at all the protein, whereas in the other case, they just looked at RNA. Is that why it's unbiased? I would or? say both of them are, well, yeah, I would yeah. say both of them are unbiased. I, I would think <clears throat> Ian Lipkin would say his is unbiased as yeah. well, because you're sure. doing total sequence, right? Sure. Yeah. Right. And or, by the way... Or at least, or at least they, uh, they're, they're relatively unbiased, but you know, you're looking at different molecules. They're going to have a, some sort of a bias based on uh, what kind of molecule you're looking at. Okay? Right. Exactly. Right. They're both relatively unbiased. Yeah, I, I must also add here that beekeeping goes all the way back to the Egyptians, and perhaps even before that. You There's can still see. Egyptians around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but this goes back to the ancient Egyptians. Okay. And yeah. you can see in the hieroglyphs actual uh, representations of what is unmistakably a honeybee. Hmm. So they actually used honey in part of their embalming fluids. So a lot of a lot of history here. So the bee, the domesticated bee, has been around a long, long, long time. Time enough for it to become highly inbred, right? And that 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 allows it to be susceptible to a lot of things that ordinarily, you know, um, hybrid vigor uh, excluded. Going to have uh, bees in your vertical farms, Dixon? Yeah, but they'll be bumblebees. They'll be bumblebees. Why is that? Well, because they don't sting. They They're will, easy they to will keep. pollinate also, though. Yes, absolutely. There they are no make honey though, right? No, there indoor there are indoor colonies of bumblebees yeah. now being used. Yeah, they're actually sold to uh, commercial greenhouses already. Wow. That's right. Yep. Uh, this is becoming this week in agriculture. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's all linked. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. 
well, then we should just have one podcast called This Week, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Or that was the week that was, but that was on, uh, I think, Saturday Night Live or something. It was. <laughs> yes. All right, so here they basically got protein sequences. They fragmented the yeah. cell proteins and then so they got did proteomics, hundreds then. and hundreds of sequences. Right, proteomics. And then they put them in a computer and say, what are these things? Huh. Yeah, mass spectrometry-based proteomics. Wow. So a mass spec will separate the little fragments of the protein uh, according to their properties, and then you take each fragment and you can get a sequence. It's remarkable. And you figure out what it is. Yeah, is that that's a technology that has um, that has really advanced in leaps and bounds in the past uh, five to ten years. You talked about this <clears throat> on a pick of the week recently, I think. You had some site that yes. explained this, right? Yeah, it's actually it's a, it's been a recurring topic for uh, for stories that I do. Um, and uh, one of the publications I write for is Drug Discovery and Development. Uh, yeah. It's a trade magazine, and um, and mass spec is huge in the drug discovery industry because they're dealing with small molecules and proteins, and they need to be able to, to analyze these things chemically. Um, but the the technology on mass spec has really just advanced to the point where um you know for for a lot of users i think it functions essentially like a magic box you plug your sample into one end and it tells you exactly what's in wow. it uh, and you can get these types of things where you you plug in an incredibly complex mix of complex molecules proteins right. in this case um and you you get out uh, there's a little more to it than this I, obviously some work went into this paper but um but what you can get out of one of these machines is a pretty complete list of every protein that was in the mix that you put in. You know, Alan, if I had known about this five years ago, I might have gotten my grant renewed. <laughs> well, yeah, five years ago, it might not have been quite as far along. Perhaps not, but uh, I certainly would have proposed it. <laughs> it wouldn't have yes. stopped me. <laughs> and uh, this uh, this paper is, I guess you were going to get into this, Vincent. This paper is an interesting collaboration between a couple of uh, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, a yeah. couple of academic groups in Montana. Oh, yes. yeah, both uh, Missoula oh, yes. and uh, Bozeman, and uh, the military. Now, why is the military uh, involved? Well, in the interesting thing, let me, i got to remember, the uh, military guys are the Edgewood Chemical Biological Center. Uh, and um, they're, they're really good at the mass spec stuff. And, the, and, and so they handled the mass spec part of this, not only the actual technology of the spectroscopy itself, but as important, the software for the analysis of the peptides and the database searching. Which and I'm the, proud to say, the person on the paper who appears to, ha to have handled that, uh, the computer information sciences guy, is from Towson University. There you go. Yeah, I was going to say, the Edgewood is in uh, Maryland. My alma mater. It's in, uh, in uh, Maryland. Yes. So the, the the military has an interest in this because oh, what say. they'd like to be able to do is I'll take say. samples from the field and uh, do yeah, yeah. some sort of rapid analysis. I mean, some soldier comes back and he's sick uh, and they want a, uh, a, right. a rapid diagnostic in particular for something like a biological weapon or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And they want to be able to uh, basically stick it in their tricorder and find out uh, <laughs> what it is instantaneously. And so they have an interest in this kind of technology. Yeah. The other thing I found out is that uh, there's actually a, a history of uh, this particular center and uh, uh, honeybees. There's um, uh, an older story where they were investigating whether honeybees could sniff out landmines. Oh, Okay, uh, but there's uh, in this New York Times <laughs> Times uh, write up of this, which is a very nice write up. There's a an interesting uh, description of the relationship between the academicians and the military, and how they came together almost by chance because of uh, a, a a couple of brothers who were uh, familiar with different aspects of the project who got together. It was interesting, right? This is a quite a collaborative group here. A lot yes. of different, and that's great because that's what really you need yes. to do this kind of a study. Absolutely. It's like, see, Dixon, if you had collaborated with someone who could do this, who knew? <laughs> yeah, but at the time it wasn't developed. But no, today, that's, true. that's how you make it go forward. Absolutely. We have to swallow our egos oh. and collaborate. I never had an ego problem here. And then but you I, have I, I'm lack not of contacts. You. I'm not blaming you. <laughs> you. You put a lot of authors on the paper. Sure. But the science moves forward. That's you know the key. That is and I'm really happy to see the Army save the honeybees. That's, huh. Yes. That, that's good Good stuff for the <laughs> there Army. There you go. 
Very well, cool. it's actually it's pretty amazing how broad a scope military research has. They Absolutely. they do some stuff that is oh sure. You know, you think of oh they're developing better bombs, but they but there's just yeah. an enormous amount of military research that's very much basic science and yeah. aimed at <clears throat> things like uh, what what Rich just said. You know, you're advancing something like mass spec, and that's going right. to have direct benefits. But you're also using it in service of. Uh, of something here that's uh, really a major geopolitical in- issue. No not, I'm not sure that that's well publicized, right? It's not. It should no. be. Is it sci- Is it secret? Is that the problem? Um, no, I don't think so. This is not. Some a lot of military research is uh, secret, and there's a tradition of not trumpeting it too loudly um, from the military standpoint. Mm-hmm. So. I, I think that, and I think in the scientific community, there's a there's a perception that military research is uh, is off limits if you're an academic. Um, so there probably ought to be more collaborations like this. People should uh, should see what DoD is doing on their on well, their particular. Interest. You know, for young people just going in the field, you know, consider the military because they're well funded. They have great right. equipment. That's true. Can do a lot of good stuff. Yep. Um, maybe I mean, you didn't know about this, but. Think about it. Right? There's several places. Walter Reed is one of those places, and Fort Detrick and uh, Frederick. They all have big uh, virology groups. And uh, in fact, and loss all- of fever was uh, originally characterized by the military. Uh, yeah, a lot of the national labs that were uh, developed really during the you know uh, Manhattan Project yep. uh, to research and develop the atomic bomb. After that was all over, they had to sort of reinvent themselves sure. and become involved in stuff like. Uh, genetic research and et cetera, and are doing uh, uh, quite useful things. And there's yeah, always and been a. Rich- it's not just a PR stunt either. Um, no, oh, the, no. Uh, the military actually has a legitimate interest in uh, in these things. It may not be immediately obvious, but if you can imagine, uh, you know, what happens if pollination collapses in Africa? Of course. Um, that's going to be the military's problem. You bet. Uh, maybe not immediately, but in a very short no, time. That's right. And they've always had a deep interest in tropical diseases of all yes. kinds. Yes. And in, in Britain as well. Uh, getting back to this paper, their yes, first sentence first. is, um, in 2010, colony collapse disorder again devastated honeybee colonies in the U.S., indicating that the problem is neither diminishing nor has it been resolved. So that's the impetus. Now, what they did, they in this paper, they had specimens from a couple of years ago, 2006, 7, and 8, and they did this mass spec sequencing of the proteins, and they found that so in hives sampled across the U.S., they consistently found a virus and a fungus together, not either one alone, but together. Mm-hmm. So in diseased uh, colonies across the U.S., and then they went to a colony that was in the process of collapsing, and they sampled it over time, and they found an increasing level of both of these pathogens. So both of those studies can be characterized as a retrospective and a right. prospective study. Yes. The, the second is the prospective <laughs> as you're going along. So they did everything right. How many collapsing colonies did they sample? I um, think it's just one. Just one one, one okay. collapsing colony, and that's in Montana, I believe. Do they talk about it, the percentage of colonies in the U.S. that are uh, affected by this? Last time I heard it, it was around 30%. I think, yeah. That's, that's a big number. number. When you add up yeah how much money that represents in terms of agricultural produce. That's a huge number. Yeah. Let me see. So there was also a Florida colony that was um, where it had recurred, so they had gotten rid Ah, of it, and it came back, and they found these two. So the two are very interesting. We should talk about these. One is a DNA virus. So, so far, they've only found RNA viruses, but now this is the first time we find a DNA, a big DNA virus. It's called invertebrate iridescent virus, Right. IIV, close to Rich's heart. You bet. <laughs> Double-stranded DNA containing virus in the general arena of nucleocytoplasmic viruses. This is a little different than the pox viruses, but kind of sort of related. Um, starts off its DNA replication into the nucleus, and then the DNA uh, uh, partially replicated moves to the cytoplasm where it forms concatomers before being packaged. And I think it undergoes a little bit more DNA replication there, um, sets up these assembly sites and finishes off the life cycle in the, uh, in the cytoplasm. Why is it called iridov? Uh, because this is terrific, and we can maybe post uh, some pictures of this. Yes, when, naively. <laughs> yes, right, of course. The, when, these, uh, 
viruses that they a lot of them and in fact uh, insects uh, but there are also iridoviruses of fish and amphibians and in fact uh, the the best study of these is a guy named frog virus 3 that has been uh, widely implicated as uh, a part of the big amphibian die-off. Huh. Um, at any rate, uh, a lot of these infect insects, and when they accumulate at high concentrations, they form uh, crystalline arrays that uh, refract the light cool. in a faction that reflects in yeah, it's either cool. blue or green colors. So you see these sow bugs. There's some you can find them on the internet. Pictures <laughs> yeah, we're of looking sow at bugs. one right now that are blue or green and in and the right light they actually kind of shine at you wow. so they're iridescent wow it's beautiful we have to use one of these for our for the image for this uh, episode it's beautiful i i didn't know this uh, that's a ton of virus too yeah. I'm, I'm sure so are these limited to insects or they infect uh other? insects uh, the the hosts i know of are insects fish and amphibians Amphibians, including things. yes, cold-blooded amphibians, including um, salamanders and frogs. There may be uh, there may be others as well, but those are the those are the major major species affected that I'm aware of. Interesting. Hmm. So these are big, two hundred kb big. roughly. Two hundred kb. Are they? That's they're not vector borne, are they? Uh, not are they? that I am aware they, of. They actually speculate on that in this paper in the discussion a bit. They don't know how it's transmitted among the bees, and one possibility is, is any of these mite-type things that are sure. infecting them could bring it in. Mm -hmm. So that's one component, but they always, if they, if this is alone, it doesn't cause disease as severe as when the second guy is, which is Nosema, right. which is a microsporidian fungus. Indeed. It's a parasite. It is a parasite. So is it intracellular or... Yeah. It used to be classified as a protozoan, mm -hmm. but because of the uh, wow. the, um, the ribosomal RNA patterns, they yeah. were able to distinguish it quite nicely from protozoans and uh, move it back into the fun fungal zone, just like they did for uh, uh, Pneumocystis carinii. So they say here it's a unicellular parasite that mainly affects honeybees. So it's Nosema apis, I guess. Uh, that's not true. Nosema, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, uh, okay. I would rewrite this because I knew a very good friend of mine. His name is Earl Widener. He worked at Louisiana State University on Nosema infections in crabs. Mm -hmm. The blue claw crab and the, the whole blue claw crab industry right. was affected by this thing. And uh, so crustaceans, I think arthropods is a better way to put it. Well, I think this particular... Species, apis, oh no, right? no, I would agree but with you. But the Nosema species, yeah, it's all over the place. Uh, genus, and, the and, genus, and they're Nosema, beautiful. Yeah. They're absolutely gorgeous when you look at them under the electron microscope. They have some remarkable structures. So this is the most widespread of adult honeybee diseases. Yeah, it almost looks like a nematocyst. I don't know if so, uh, listeners would know what that is, but uh, let's look for a picture here. They're quite gorgeous, and uh, Earl Widener uh, took some amazing electron micrographs of this thing, and. Uh, was, yeah, was really plenty. fantastic. Does that look right? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Much of that looks right. This one? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Nosema guts. There's a trigger, the trigger mechanism, and out they come and uh, you know cause cell damage. They do all kinds of bad things. All right, so the key is that both of these things are present. So it's a co-infection that's actually doing the damage. That's what they think. And they actually did an experiment where they took bees and they uh, infected them with the virus or the microsporidian or both right and they did a survival curve <laughs> over 14 days now this is figure three in the paper you know i don't do bee experiments so <laughs> i don't know how how good this is but the yeah. green curve is the control right the control I, don't, I guess that means uninfected but why are they dying do, do bees die within 14 days that's what they say is typically when you uh, raise them, I guess, in captivity. Die. That they 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 expect that they don't do well okay. uh, under these under the sorts of conditions that they use. So they kind of expected that. All right. So you put virus in. That's the blue curve. That die they die faster. And if you put nosema in alone, it's about the same rate as the virus. If you put both of them in, it goes down a little faster. I mean, but to not me, too much faster. It's not that much. No, for, it wasn't striking. No, no. It, it's no. not striking. I would agree. And there are no error bars here. Right. So they do provide, they indicate that they've done some statistics here saying that it is statistically significant. Right. But mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they 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 waffle in there. How about marginally significant? Yeah, they they know that uh, they know that we're going to have this discussion. That's right. Well, at least they did one experiment. I'm sure that's not easy to do this. Well, and one of the right. things that they point out, this is interesting because um, uh, the the hit that they got when they identified this virus uh, is okay. They're searching a database. The database has known viruses in it. The only completely sequenced uh, uh, insect iridovirus is um, Kylo iridescent virus, IIV6. Now, the bees are not the normal host for that virus. Right. They speculate in the paper that, in fact, the real culprit here is not IIV6, right. but some other B iridovirus. Yeah. But they haven't been able to culture that or grow it out. Gotcha. But when yeah. they did this experiment, they used the only virus they could culture, See which point. was IIV6. So it may right. not be the appropriate virus. Yeah. In yeah. fact, in the discussion, they say, we're trying to culture the B virus so that we can fulfill Koch's postulates. Uh-huh. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So I, I skipped over that. That's important. There is an effect, but it's probably not the right virus. Yeah. Right. I mean, the epidemiology is very strong, but uh, you right. need yeah. these kind of experiments are what is going to nail it, right? Or not. They're, they're very or not. close. <laughs> yeah. It'll certainly, if you do the science right, you'll be able to say something at least. They're very cautious in their conclusions. I mean, you know, yeah. our study strongly suggests a sure. correlation, okay? Our inoculation experiments uh, confirmed greater lethality uh, in the co-infections, okay? Right, right. Future research, we got to do more. That's right. Got to study it more, okay? That's so right. they're, they're very cautious in their conclusions. So they say in the end, we suggest that for beekeepers suffering from colony losses, uh, use treatments to control nosemia, which, nosema, which are apparently available. So yeah. that'll it, be another component over the next year if people treat with agents to control nosema and it takes care of it then that's more support that as long as they don't use atrazine what's that atrazine is an antifungal agent that's used to control wheat rust and atrazine is what's responsible for the teratogenic effects in developing frogs and amphibians to give them three legs five legs you know convert males to females it has a bad effect Mm -hmm. on small mouth and large mouth bass for instance and it's used extensively throughout the Midwest, the upper Midwest, for the wheat. And uh, it's been banned in Europe because of these uh, side effects of these uh, endocrine-like uh, disruptors. But if they if they recommend the beekeepers start to use an antifungal, and the most available one is atrazine, yeah. they may be uh, extending the zone of that uh, influence all the way down into the south. Yeah, but against the background of atrazine that's already being used in agriculture, how big an impact would that be? I don't know. And it might introduce it to places where they're not using atrazine right now. That's true, right. Because it's mostly a wheat and corn thing that they're looking at. Right. So so watch out, Rich. It might be coming your way. By the way, Dixon, there are uh, aeronaviruses of mosquitoes. Cool. Yeah. Do they they kill them? Yeah, that's my question. Uh, I think so. Yeah? Interesting. Uh, I'm 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 not sure here. I'm just I'm um, I'm still learning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, out there there are huge numbers of natural control elements, including infections of various kinds, that uh, keep populations at bay. Early mosquito larval stage is most susceptible to infection. Clinical disease, uh, but clinical disease, yellow green iridescence beneath the epidermis and death rates are highest. Hold it, hold it. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. Breaking up is hard to do. How do you sound, uh, Alan? Are you? Uh, I don't know. How do I sound? You sound, you sound great. Okay. Am I still breaking up? No, no, you're fine now, Rich. Okay. It just sounded like you were being beamed up. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Maybe I was. We're being sucked into a black hole. Uh, Rich, do you know any iridovirologists? Uh, In fact, Uh, uh, you met Susan DeCosta while you were here. Yeah. Uh, She did her PhD on coronavirus. Oops, you're breaking up. Hold on, Rich. Do you have a USB connector? Yes, I do. Try pulling it out and putting it back in. Are you back? Can you hear me now? Perfect. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Dulcet tone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You got it. You can't okay. hear us. So she had worked uh, I on. I can hear you. Uh, she had worked on, but she doesn't. So you met, Su- you met Susan when you were here. Yeah. And uh, she she did her PhD on chylo iridescent virus. As a matter of fact, one of the authors on this paper is a guy named Shan Billamoria, who was uh, who uh, was her PhD mentor at Texas Tech University. Oh, nice. And... Uh, 
In fact, Susan is a co-author on about four of the references uh, in this. So I uh, consulted her in preparation for this episode and learned a little more about keratoviruses. So, Rich, in there Florida, are the orange trees and the orange blossoms, are those uh, bee required for pollination? I do not know. Because that's I do not one know. of your big industries, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I know another uh, iridovirus uh, guy, a guy named Gregory Chinchar, who hmm. uh, is a, works on Frog Virus 3, uh, and um, is sort of one of the remaining people in that. And, and that turns out to be, uh, you know, it sounds funny. I work on a frog virus. I grow it on fathead minnow cells, right? Exactly. Uh, but it's an important pathogen. Sure. Uh, and it is the model system for understanding uh, uh, iridoviruses. Well, I got to tell you that Peter Palazzi worked on Frog Virus 3 when he first came to the Did U.S. He? as a postdoc. He worked with Brian, right? Brian McCauslin at the Roche Institute. No kidding. And he, <laughs> wow. he was working on the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase of that virus, which was among, it was in the early days, the first time people had found uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It was in uh, one of those large DNA viruses. I can't remember yeah, which Yeah, McCausland and Cates were responsible in for pox? the pox virus RNA polymerase. So yeah. I think that was the first one. And then Peter found it in Frog and did some studies on that. So there you go. Remarkable. One, one more thing I want to point out here is that um, um, they say that there were severe bee losses in India in the 1970s, and they wonder mm. whether the first widespread losses of bees in the U.S., described as disappearing disease in the 1970s may have been early outbreaks of colony collapse. So this could mm -hmm. be an old disease, which, you know, for mm -hmm. various reasons mm -hmm. is you know, getting more attention. A, a lot of uh, articles also talk about the stress of wintering over bees. A lot of them are kept down in uh, Texas because of the mild weather conditions, but they're shipped all over the country. And, you know, cattle suffer from a, something called a shipper's disease. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so this may affect the immune system of the bee just enough to push them over the edge if they encounter the pathogens. Well, in fact, they sampled some Australian bees that were shipped over here in packages mm. to keep them cool and they can live a long time. And some mm. of those were had both pathogens as well. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's a cool story. We took a while because it's pretty complicated. But I just want to end with the fact that this is one paper. It doesn't prove anything. Right. What it does is give you leads to work on sure in science nothing right. is concluded from one paper right you right. usually need confirmation and i think the public needs to understand that because nowadays everyone gets excited over one paper right but you need more that's just the way science works here, here. whether or not this is true we'll, we'll find out in the coming year mm -hmm. yeah i actually i did a quick google search on nosema because i was looking for you know, information and pictures on it before the show, and and half the hits were news items on how Nosema causes colony collapse. <laughs> yeah, see, that's part of the problem is that nowadays all this all these papers get picked up because of press yeah, releases, yeah, and, yeah. and then people believe that this must be it, right? Right. But it's not the way it works, and mm -hmm. it's the same with XMRV. It has to be validated, and colony collapse has you to bet. be valid. You know, the, the Lipkin paper was not validated, so that's it. Right. And this is the way science goes. So if you learn anything from this, and that's that, right? That's important. That's but right. the, one the, of the, the good part is once we occurred. get to an answer, we know it's right. <laughs> After enough papers, yeah. What, Go ahead, Rich. One of the things that occurred to me in thinking about this is, is that um, it's, it's interesting to me that there seems to be such an interest in this in the popular press. Yes. You know, because I don't think, I don't think everybody walking around, uh, you know, realizes all the necessarily all the economic uh implications of the bees i think mm -hmm. it's just sort of intrinsically the story about the bees is intrinsically interesting sure okay and um uh, i would like uh people who feel that way to uh uh look at themselves and realize that that's their basic science gene kicking in they yeah, didn't exactly. even know they had it <laughs> that's right <laughs> but it's that's just right. good point rich that's a great yeah, point actually good. Yeah, you want to know what's going on. Love it. Uh, we also have a, we have a few beekeepers listening. I know that Tom is a honeybee pollinator on California. He listen. I don't know if he's still listening, but uh, he um, sent me a long letter some time ago, which I'll post a link to. And he gave us his opinion about what's happening with the bees, and he listed all the things that are 
affecting them. This was back in December '09, and one of them is Nosema, a microsporidium. How about that? Several viruses, right. probably more than we know about. So it was prescient. There you go. I was thinking of actually the paper describing reverse transcriptase by separately by Baltimore and Temin. It was validated by many other groups immediately afterward. I mean, that wasn't the final word. No. Within the year, everyone right. did it with their retrovirus. And they, yeah, it's right. And that's why they got the Nobel Prize. Well, and the reason it was quick to validate was it was a, it was a molecular finding. Yeah. You didn't have to go out into the wild and find sure. animals that are you know, <laughs> sure. being trucked around the country. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. um, you just had to go into the lab and use reagents that uh, the yeah. dozens of labs yeah. already had. Sure, this is much more complicated. But it just is a concept. That's how it has to work in all science. Well, it's it's beautiful, though, that you point out a real-world problem here. Yeah. I mean, here's a, a problem that says, is it a virus or isn't it? Is it a uh, fungus or isn't it? And the answer could be it's both. It could be even a third thing. Like there are environmental situations yeah, that give sure. rise to all this, it's, too, and allow this to happen. This is why I work in the lab. It's too complicated it's, out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it's a very difficult thing to sort out because uh, you are dealing with the real world at this yeah. point. Okay, let's go on to our second real-world problem, which uh, actually was sent by Felix, who said, here's an interesting story about the resurgence of monkeypox in Africa, and he originally sent the link to a Discover Magazine story, uh, which was entitled, Goodbye Smallpox Vaccination, Hello Monkeypox. <laughs> and I thought Rich would like this one. Um, yes, indeed. I, I know I'm not wrong about that. <laughs> it was a dead silence. So, uh, by. <laughs> and there was a PNAS so, paper uh, supporting this article as well, right? Yeah, and actually, the Discover article was uh, was quite good. It's still loading so, here. Um, yeah. uh, let's just uh, make sure we got the background straight here, very briefly. Uh, pox virus. The 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 Earth is lousy with pox viruses. Um, these are large, complex DNA-containing viruses, repl unique because they replicate in the cytoplasm, the most notorious. Uh, the, commonly in vertebrates, they infect a variety of different species, but in, in vertebrates, commonly the disease is what we call an exanthemous disease, which means there's a rash associated with it, in this case, a bunch of blisters. The real bad guy was smallpox that killed a lot of people. Uh, until we discovered that we could immunize people with uh, a virus, a related virus that was uh, initially found in the wild called vaccinia that causes a very limited disease. And we used that to uh, ultimately, uh, successfully, er apparently, successfully eradicate the disease. But there's still a lot of pox viruses out there, a few of which uh, infect humans. Now, the interesting thing is that when the disease was declared eradicated in the late 70s, uh, along with the eradication, uh, the World Health Organization said you should no longer immunize against smallpox because there is a certain risk of complications from the vaccination, including a certain risk of uh, dying about uh, one in a healthy population, about one in a million of people who are vaccinated uh, actually get in uh, usually encephalitis and die from the vaccination. Mm. Uh, and so that's a that's a fairly significant risk and uh, much more significant than getting smallpox. Um, but there was a little bit of concern that some of the other existing uh, pox virus diseases that were actually covered by the vaccine might get to be a, a problem. The most uh, vexing of those is this disease, which is actually kind of misnamed monkeypox, uh, which uh, exists primarily uh, in the Congo in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where it was discovered. It's actually a zoonosis in, hu in, in humans. That is that the animal reservoir, we don't know exactly what it is, but uh, it has been found in a number of uh, different rodents. And it can also obviously infect uh, monkeys, but that's probably not the primary reservoir. Um, and it can be transmitted to humans where it causes a smallpox-like disease. As a matter of fact, the disease is, I think, clinically almost indistinguishable from, uh, from smallpox. Is it, it has, is it fatal like smallpox? It can be. It has a much uh, lower fatality rate depending on the mm. strain and the conditions. It's between uh, 1 and 10%. Uh, case fatality rate. 10% is a high case fatality Very rate. Very high. 
Yeah. Not as high as smallpox. Smallpox got up to 30%, which is one of the reasons it was so deadly. Sure. Um, but 10% is not at all trivial. I think one of the most important things about monkeypox is that the uh, transmission among humans is uh, very limited. There's one study that I uh, found that was done uh, uh, in the uh, early 80s after the smallpox uh, eradication campaign was finished that, to address this idea. And their best measure of the what's called the secondary attack rate was uh, 4%, which is fairly Gee. low. Even after contact? Uh, yes. This is amongst households and that kind of stuff. What was and it for was, smallpox? Just remind us for smallpox. Uh, I don't know what the secondary attack rate there was, but uh, I would imagine very significantly well, higher. It had to be high because there's no reservoir for smallpox, right? Yeah, so the only way to right. catch that it is a, to come That was a contact. human disease. Exactly right. right. Oh, I don't know what the secondary attack rate there was, but I would imagine it was quite high. Yeah, I think so. At any rate, uh, from an epidemiologic point of view, the, that secondary attack rate, I think, is low enough, uh, even in unvaccinated individuals, and they took the vaccination status of individuals into account when they when they did that, that 4%, that roughly 4% rate was in uh, unvaccinated individuals. 25 uh, to 40%. Attack rate uh, for secondary smallpox. attack rate for smallpox. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, I was just, I was just looking that up. Because that's how you get epidemics. <laughs> right. Yeah. So at any rate, that 4% secondary attack rate was thought of to be uh, uh, low enough so that uh, eventually th it would be epidemiologically self-limiting. In fact, some thought that the uh, disease would actually burn itself out. So as part of the mandate uh, during the aftermath of the smallpox eradication campaign, there was uh, surveillance in Africa of monkeypox between about 1980 and 1986. Uh, to make sure that there wasn't going to be a huge resurgence. And during that period of time, uh, there was some monkeypox around, um, but uh, it, they didn't see anything huge, and so they quit the surveillance. Uh, this study, um, which was spearheaded by uh, somebody named uh, Ann Rimoin, R-I-M-O-I-N, if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from UCLA in collaboration with some groups in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. The senior author is Jean-Jacques uh, May Mayembe. Mayembe. Okay, so it's, it's a, this is a very significant collaboration. Got a lot of different people in it. Yeah. Um, they uh, decided to revisit this problem and see, because there's been anecdotal evidence uh, since then that monkeypox was kind of reemerging in the Congo. And also there was this incident in 2003 where there was an importation of monkeypox right. from Ghana in the exotic pet trade into the U.S. and uh, a number of people were infected. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, fortunately it was a... Uh, one of the milder strains, and uh, nobody actually died, but it was uh, a scare. So this uh, PNAS paper reports on uh, a survey that was done between 2005 and 2007, and uh, a, a thorough statistical analysis, and they report that, in fact, the incidence of monkeypox compared to the survey done in 1981 to 86 has gone up 20-fold. So that's not insignificant. Uh, so that's not insignificant. So their conclusion from the paper is that um, there's uh, there is in fact a reemergence of monkeypox uh, in the Congo. Hmm. Wow, there's a photo here of a boy with it. it just looks just like uh, smallpox. Looks yeah? just like smallpox. Wow, it's disfiguring, that's, right? Right. Not yes. good. And they take in hmm. they uh, they divide these people. Uh, they do a number of different. Uh, analyses on this. I should say the um, incidence, let me get the actual numbers here. Uh, the incidence uh, range from 2 to 14 per 10,000, 2 to 14 cases per 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, the average annual cumulative incidence of 5.5 uh, .5 per uh, 10,000 which is uh, about 20-fold uh, higher than had been in the uh, survey in 81 to 86. Uh, and there's uh, a five-fold higher risk in vaccinated versus unvaccinated persons, so they took that into account. And they also did some geographic distribution stuff and found that the highest incidence, perhaps not surprisingly, was in uh, people who lived 
near the forest. Okay, because mm -hmm. that's probably where the reservoir is. And these are, uh, and actually, interestingly, a higher incidence in males, because they're the guys who go in the forest and do the hunting. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So they encounter, prob they have a higher probability of, in, uh, of encountering the reservoir. So now they, the they're assuming bushmeat, right? Right. Yes. Ah, nice. Exactly. That's my phone. Excuse me, gentlemen. So this is uh, in, in the year. 2006 7, 760 cases, if I'm reading this table right. right. That's it's not, correct. In, not insignificant. Not insignificant. And so, okay. uh, do we need to do something? Do we need to intervene in some way? Well, uh, they, they, um, uh, they have some recommendations in that regard. Um, they, they say that um, one of the problems was, that, you know, 30 years after a singular accomplishment of smallpox eradication, the increasing incidence of monkeypox uh, should be closely monitored. Failure to pursue a more comprehensive assessment of epidemiology risk and possible control could have serious implications. Now, it's um, important to understand, though, I think, the context in which this is happening in Congo. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas earlier, I mean, if you, if you look at data from the early 1980s um, that may have been a time of slightly greater stability in many African countries, um, mm -hmm. at least some. <laughs> right, and, or different uh, ones, that's for sure. Different ones, yeah. And in the case of, uh, certainly in the case of Congo, um, Tough. That, that's a place that's not in good shape right, right. now. That's true. Exactly, so and I'm, they I'm point sure out... One of the drivers of this is that the, the chaos is leading more people to, say, turn yeah. to bushmeat. And that, absolutely. And they, they, they point that out in the paper. So it could be that ultimately uh, this can be dealt with by uh, appropriate public health measures, okay, if you have a sort of a stable uh, situation in the society going on. What's, right. what's not uh, immediately, at least I wouldn't immediately recommend, is trying to reintroduce vaccination because there, mm -hmm. you have the problems of the complications with the yeah. vaccine, you have the problems with uh, administering the vaccine. So that's that is currently not a practical solution unless it got bad enough so that maybe ultimately you would want to go in with um, uh, one of the new attenuated vaccines or or, right. or something right. like that. So wait a minute. What about somebody recovering from from monkeypox? Could you use a pustule from that like they did in the beginning and scarify and take that virus isolate and immunize against it using that one. I would rather use vaccinium. I would rather use the vaccine because the monkeypox is more lethal than the, okay. than the vaccine. If you're going to, even you're in a recovery anything, patient, uh, uh, I, yes, okay. um, that, that virus is going to be okay. uh, just as lethal as, as what went into them. Okay. Dixon. So, the solution so, is to build a vertical farm <laughs> so they don't have to eat bush meat. Well, yeah, but not in a chaotic country like this. They'll just knock it down, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be a big problem, I think. So, and they, they also point out in this that, um, you know, this is a, it's a problem that have, has implications that goes beyond just the Congo. A case in point, the importation of this uh, into, the, into the U.S., okay? Oh, um, and actually, it raises... Uh, uh, an, an interesting issue about the smallpox eradication effort uh, in general, which I regard still in some respects as an experiment, okay? Mm. Uh, we, you can say that we successfully eradicated the disease, and that's uh, apparently true. And now we ceased vaccination, and that was an appropriate thing to do. But it's still an experiment. There are pox viruses out there all over the place, and there is evolution going on, and we don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of so, like when you when you stop spraying DDT for house flies, and now you get bed bugs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, during the Second World War, after they finished, uh, they got rid of leishmaniasis also, but then they stopped spraying, and they got that back too. You can think of it as, uh, you know, uh, eliminating a creature that um, occupied a certain ecological niche. You can think of it as now we have a right. uh, a vacuum in that niche. There you what go. might move in to fill the vacuum? And I know, know something. So, well, that's for sure. Well, monkeypox could evolve to transmit better among people, right? Absolutely. That's, viruses a, that's, of, that's what viruses do. <laughs> that's right. So, They're safe crackers, and they've got time on their side. Ah, I love right. it. Safe crackers. <laughs> they have a lot so, of time. Uh, so this... Uh, this sort of study is uh, is is important in its cool. own right for uh, 
uh, the people that are directly uh, affected, but it also has implications uh, beyond the uh, immediate uh, victims in the immediate area. Well, Rich, think of the other diseases that started in that general area and now are worldwide, like SIV to HIV, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lessons so learned? It's, mm -hmm. So it's worthwhile to keep an eye on this. <laughs> yeah, they suggest keeping an eye on it and also uh, Im maybe immunizing the healthcare workers who treat these mm -hmm. patients. Right, they have a... But keeping an eye on it doesn't really allow you to do something until it's too late, maybe? Right, and I think fundamentally, I until, you, until you get at the, the underlying problem, which is people having to hunt yeah, bush yeah. meat. That's right. That's uh, right. You, you, because this isn't the only virus out there in the wild right. animal population, and it's right. not the only zono zoonotic disease that we should be worried about. And, you know... How much longer before we find some new virus what coming other, out of this? What other virus do we know that are probably originated from bush meat, eating bush meat? Well, I said HIV. You did? I did. Oh, I'm sorry. I slept through that part. That's okay. I just said SIV <laughs> switched over sorry. to HIV. Sorry. I mean, that was yeah. the classic, right? Yeah, so, I mean, in, in the, the, the meat market in Hong Kong and SARS. So I don't know examples. if you can change that, Alan, because yeah. people... Don't. Well, it's. I think. I think you may not have much traction changing it if it's a cultural preference, yeah. right? But in a case where it's a survival need, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think you'd actually have a really good chance of changing it. I mean, if these people could get uh, healthy, uh, agriculturally grown food, then they probably wouldn't be hunting nearly as much in the forest. I would agree with that. Uh, you know, Vincent's right. Uh, uh, Dixon's going to save us with the vertical farm. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a, the it's vertical farm everybody. is a solution to this. He, he just left the building. Elvis is no longer in the building. <laughs> Dixon, you are right. It's all intertwined. It's about right? food. It's, it's, it is it's it's all food interconnected. Food and viruses and disease, they're all... We're part of the ecology and we can't escape You our, were just our brilliant our to pick that up years ago. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm Come on. I, thank God I don't wear hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your head would be swelling. I'm afraid so. <laughs> That's a cool story. I like that. Yep. And um, they Thanks do. They, to, uh, who sent that in? That was Felix. Thanks, Felix. Felix. Thanks to Felix. And uh, let's do a few emails here. Let's complete Kelly's, who had got us on to the CCD. She says, also, would you explain the naming of flu viruses, strange as is H, uh, N1H5, N2H3? For example, N means X and H means Y, and the numbers mean what? <laughs> okay. Thanks for being approachable. Many knowledgeable people are very condescending and arrogant. You are not, and that is important to those who are trying to learn. Now, well, of uh, course the common people would say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke, uh, Kelly. Yes, that's a Way joke. to go, that's Alan. <laughs> Alan will no longer be heard on Twitter. I just disclosed that I went to a state college, so I'm the common people, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm uh, the foil uh, for this show, so... <laughs> yeah. So, Kelly, there are... You name, you name them hemagglutinin first and, and neuraminidase later, uh, second. So the hemagglutinin is the H, the neuraminidase is the N. And those are two proteins on the surface of the virus. And there are 16 hemagglutinins and nine neuraminidases. You can have all different combinations. And birds are infected with all of them. Birds right. have every kind of hemagglutinin. Okay. So, that, and so you had them NH. They should be H1, N1. Or H five N one, H five N one, H three N two, H two three. A yeah. bunch of them, but we're not susceptible to all of them, are we, Vince? No, only the only hemagglutins that infect people are H one, H two, and H three. And you know, H fives infect, but they don't get transmitted, so they're not considered as human viruses yet. Exactly. Who knows? Right. So then, the exactly. strain is named by which which hemagglutin and, and which neuraminidase right. it expresses. Correct. And okay. then there's also usually another part of the name, which is the um, location where it was discovered. Right. Yeah, so there's an A or a B or a C, which is the three subtypes. Then there's a place where it's discovered, the uh, the H and the N designation. There's usually an isolate number. And a, and a year. And a year also, right. yeah. So right, a, so you a, have H, H1, N1, 2009. Yeah. Uh, California. A, it would be A, California, an a isolate California. number, 2009, right. then parentheses, H1, N1. Okay, Timothy writes, I just listened to your latest podcast, number 88, on my way to work, and heard you mention the new DVD, Naturally Obsessed. I'm wondering if you were aware of the quite similarly entitled 1999 book, Natural Obsessions, written by Natalie Angier, on the very same topic. And yes, we, it was a pick of the week on TWIV71, Timothy. 
She was allowed into the inner workings of a lab of the world-famous cancer researcher Robert Weinberg at MIT, and it so happened to be around the time his lab discovered the retinoblastoma gene, which, as you know, is a key regulatory regulator of cell growth and is a favorite target for many DNA viruses. Might this be title concept plagiarism, or alternatively, perhaps it is obvious to non-scientists that we scientists are just very obsessive people? <laughs> Probably the latter. I think the latter, that's for sure. By the way, I like like everyone else who emails you, I really enjoy your podcast. I discovered Twiv when browsing iTunes for something that I could listen to when NPR turns to all the depressing stories on war and politics during my commute. I was hooked when the first episode I listened to that I picked randomly from recent ones featured Grant McFadden discussing virotherapy for cancer, as that is my field, and he gives great talks at meetings. My PhD thesis was in virology, HPV, but I became a pediatric oncologist and now study virotherapy for children's cancer. Nice. Cool. One more thing. I know the following is probably a sad statement of the times in which we live and the fact that we are all too busy, but I was delighted to discover I can listen to Twiv at two times the speed on my iPod Touch and understand everything very clearly. <laughs> I've never tried it. I wonder what we sound like, Vince. <laughs> so, well, what are you thanks doing? for the nice letter, Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do this around Christmas and do a chipmunk imitation. So, Tim, I just want to tell you, we represent the Lollipop Guild. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> you see, the pitch, lilt, and cadence of all your voices speeds up just fine, and I can get twice as many episodes in as I might otherwise well, be Vince, able to catch. what do you think of that? And now when they play that, it'll be normal. It'll be normal. <laughs> Note, everyone's voice is not amenable to fast forward. I can't speed up futures in biotech because Mark talks so fast. Uh-huh. Thanks. To all of you for taking the time to help the wonder of viruses go viral. The beauty of my talking slow is that I only talk as fast as I can think. Dixon. <laughs> the opposite of arrogant, right? <laughs> this is from Timothy, who is a professor of pediatrics in Cincinnati. Hmm. And uh, he works on virotherapy for children's cancer. That's great. Right. I hope it works out. Yeah, me too. James writes, Hello, professors. I'm glad you said something in episode 89 that the scientific community needs to step up its PR game. I already did something small about it. I started influencing my friends with what interests me in science. I wrote an article early in June. So he has a blog and posted a... a his blog is called A Matter of Science, and it's a post called nice. Pseudoscience. And he laments that uh, the the world gets its science, you know, from uh, everything but scientists, basically. Right. So he tries to. He says, "I try to get my information from credible journals, agencies, universities, and hospitals that use regulations to uphold the scientific method." So we'll put a link to that so you can read it. But that's a nice idea, James. Thanks you know, for sending. I, that having been said, yeah. I, some of the. Uh, science writing matter of fact i think probably a fair amount of it is not bad thank the, you the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, case in point two articles that that came up with the things we did today um the what was the one the discover uh, magazine article on uh, cop on monkeypox on monkeypox that was quite good yep and there was uh, an article on uh, the colony collapse disorder that came up as well that i dug up uh, I forget what the link is, but it, it's oh, it's a New York Times uh, article that was actually posted as news from the from the military site. That was very good too. Those people mm-hmm. did their homework and yep. nicely, uh, yeah. nicely yep. summarized yep. the science. So it can be done. Yeah, it's obviously there's exceptions to everything, but um, I mean, in general, you should try to get your science from scientists if you can, not from lawyers, not from politicians. And a lot of journalists for big mainstream papers, now the Times may be an exception, tend to shrink it into a very sensational package that belies what has to be done. Right? But I think most important, cross-reference, right? If you read sure. something, just don't believe the one thing that you read. You know, right. I always I always look it up in several places. Yep. Yeah, and bear in mind that in it, particularly for stories that, that are done on very tight deadlines by high turnover staff, uh, often what you're getting is essentially a rewrite of the press release. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you may not get any kind of, uh, of in-depth analysis on it. And just because those things are reprinted on 10 different sites doesn't make them more credible. Um, 
So you, you really have to you have to look around and kind of ask questions about does this uh, pass the smell test? Well, the thing that makes you so great, Alan, is that you are a scientist, and you Why, choose to you. write about it. Yeah. So you can't get <laughs> yeah. better than that. Well, that's the best situation, but not everyone is. That's right? exactly right. right. So, yeah, just read. Should we just read journalism written by scientists? Can't do that either. Now, somehow you have to popularize the idea, and that requires somebody with writing talent like Carl Zimmer, for instance. He's one of my favorite science writers now. And, um, you know, uh, David Quammen is another one. Why don't you become a science writer? I am a science writer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot. I, my son once asked me what I did for a living. I told him I wrote for a living. Exactly. I write, you know. I, you write for I, a living. I, I, I t tell my kids that I, uh, for a living, I uh, ask people in writing to give me money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. Uh, but I, you also give them the reason for giving you the do money. Do you know what I tell my kids? When I don't I, know. I say I look for evidence. There you go. <laughs> CSI. <laughs> well, not that kind. Hey, the next one is really good. This goes back to an, yes. our, um, an episode that Alan and I did together, so you guys are off the hook here. Okay, okay. good. This is from Connie. I am an avid TWIV and TWIP listener, being a PhD molecular geneticist who is also a practicing veterinarian. Oh, right. Another one of those who trained and then didn't see herself chasing the grant dollar and waiting years for results. I love both shows and your communal erudition and humor. However... Uh oh. Twice now, once on TWIP uh -oh. and now again on TWIV, a veterinarian's perspective is sorely lacking. The TWIV incident was simply a slight misunderstanding of a parasitic zoonosis. This time, the commentary was a bit offensive regarding veterinary vaccine guidelines and motivations for those guidelines. So Alan and I were questioning why. Certain, why are you supposed to get annual vaccines yeah, for some, yeah. uh, some pet virus. So we said, oh, it's probably for them to make money. So it was an off-the-cuff uh, comment, and now uh, we're... Tough, so, tough. Yes. It's, it, now you're paying. We're paying. That's yes, okay. right. It's a great email. Since 2006, AAHA, as well as a number of other professional bodies, has set vaccine guidelines that define core vaccines for dogs and cats. Three-year duration of immunity is standard for those core vaccines. Parvo and distemper for dogs, rhinotracheitis, and panleukopenia for cats with rabies durations set via a combination of manufacturer and state standards. And she has a link for all this. While it's true that a few practitioners have been slow to embrace the new guidelines, most have, most have, and it is a mark of a high-quality practice to do so. Sadly, because companion animal medicine has scant research dollars, we are left primarily with manufacturer-funded research and so had no vaccine other than rabies labeled for three-year duration of immunity until quite recently. Hmm. Titers are also quite effective for distemper and parvo, so are frequently done in lieu of vaccines. I will also say that, having spent an externship on the Navajo Reservation, hmm. where vaccination rates are low, the core vaccines are vitally important. All right, we didn't know that, so no, I'm glad we know it now. Just to let you know that the bulk of what we do consists of a high mastery of most things medical and surgical. My days are spent with congestive heart failure, diabetes, and other endocrine disorders, renal failure, autoimmune diseases, dermatologic disease, urolithiasis, pneumonia, peritonitis, splenic renal and hepatic masses, hyperlipidemia, to name a few, while being able to perform nearly all abdominal, abdominal surgical procedures, <laughs> fracture fixation, as well as being pretty handy with abdominal and cardiac ultrasound, in addition to trauma medicine. The caseload and variety having much to do with the fact that most purebred dogs come from tiny founder populations right. with an excessive amount of inbreeding, as well as small animals' predilection to try to kill themselves with vehicles and toxins. Sadly as well, I have to keep up with the human literature— New England Journal, Lancet, Annals of Internal Medicine, Annals of Emergency Medicine as well, since my own branch is so underfunded that much of what we do is extrapolative. And these are tw 10 to 12-hour days for a median national salary of $75,000 per year with vaccines accounting for probably 1% of my income. Right. To put it in perspective, I nearly choked on my biscuit when Sarah Palin made fun of C. elegans research, millions of dollars to study worms. I believe was the quote. So please don't pale in the vet veterinarian. We try very hard to do good medicine at low cost. Here, here. I forgive you, but do want you to be slightly sensitive to your fellow science geeks. Yes. Okay. So this is from Connie White, <clears throat> uh, DVM, <laughs> and she mentions she has a PhD, which is not on her business card. And uh, Connie, I'd like you to know I have a large plate of crow. 
sitting right here. In front of me. <laughs> Chow so, down after the show. That was uh, that was uh, entirely an inappropriate uh, yeah. uh, comment. Mm-hmm. And and in fact, my own belief. I've I've kidded my wife about this. Is uh, people go to medical school because they couldn't get into veterinary school. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, vets are are overworked and um, most of them are probably underpaid. <laughs> and, and they do magic. Their patients can't talk to them. That's yeah, exactly, exactly what I was going to say. The the level of uh, of skill and, uh, sure. and capability required to do that is just astonishing. Well, um, and not only that, uh, look at all the diseases that are zoonotic that have hit the human scene over the last 20 years. Yes. The vets have been at the forefront of most of that, and no one listened to them. Uh, right, right. So the reason the reason for the vaccine recommendations being so much more frequent in animals, as Connie has pointed out, um, is that people have not done the research to have longer recommendations. Um, yeah. So you would you would actually have to have a study where you yep. lined up a bunch of dogs and cats and and vaccinated them at different um, time points and then checked for immunity. And uh, you'd think that wouldn't be too difficult a study to get funded, but. Uh, uh, as she points out, the money goes to human research. Exactly. Or large and she also animal. points out that vaccinations are vitally important. We've talked about rabies here before. Sure. About sure. If you don't have appropriate control for rabies, you got a really significant problem. Yeah. Right. So you want to err on the side of doing it too often. Yeah, I think the vets that make a lot of money are the ones that work for large animal uh, husbandry groups like cattlemen and things of this sort. Well, and racehorses. And, you know... Uh, in vitro in planting of embryos to ship a herd around the world, so to speak. Right. Well, Connie, so we're sorry. It's a great, uh, it's a great way to explain it. And, um, yeah, and thanks for the letter. That was, thank uh, you. Uh, yes. yeah. and if you and were thank still God listening. I wasn't part of that <laughs> broadcast. <laughs> well, maybe if you had been, you would have set us straight, right? Well, I wouldn't have said that. I would might've said something else, but not that that's for sure. Anyway, Connie, if you're still listening, why don't you join us now and then? Absolutely. You know? Good idea. Yeah. Here, here. I Absolutely. Mean, Let's not get every the week, perspective. you know, once every few months you That'd could come great. on and, uh, I know you're busy, but you could relax doing this. I'll tell you. You could yeah. give us a day in the life of. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more, because I don't know if you're going to be here next week. And, uh, this one has your name in it. Uh Oh, Dear oh, Twiv, I'm a third-year medical student here at Columbia. Dr. De Pommier actually interviewed me when I applied, and I had a lot to do with my decision to choose this school. And then he told us about Twiv during a parasitology small group session last fall and had a lot to do with my listening to this show when I should be studying for exams. <laughs> Uh-oh. I know this is rather tangential to the topic of virology, but I wanted to comment on the SMN1 and SMN2 genes mentioned in the discussion of Andrew's letter in TWIV number 88. SMN1 and SMN2 are actually different genes located near each other in the human genome. Other mammals only have SMN1. Two arose due to a gene duplication in humans. Spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, is due to a mutation in SMN1 that causes improper splicing of the mRNA, resulting in a non-functional protein. The mRNA for SMN2 is spliced like SMN1, should be spliced about 10% of the time, so it can actually serve as a rescue for the defective SMN1. Different individuals have different numbers of the duplicated 2 gene in their genome, so there are different severities of SMA. Those with more copies of SMN2 make enough of the close enough protein that the disease may be fairly mild, while those with few copies of SMN2 can have severe disease, perhaps even dying in infancy. Yes, I, I, there's someone here who does research on this. Maybe you are working with him, Heather, because I was on a qualifying exam a few weeks ago, and that was the topic of one of the students' uh, post uh, Now, you know, proposals. I do a lot of interviewing here for medical students, mm-hmm. and that topic would have never come up during my conversations. No. With this them. was on a, a TWIV where someone mentioned these genes, and we didn't know much about them, so Heather was just yeah. filling us in. But nonetheless, you can still tell who these people are by just talking with them about normal things in their own lives yeah. and you get the impression that they can think their way through things and this is a very good example of the kind of student we have here. Well, We're very to, proud of people like that. To get into this school you need to be pretty sharp, don't very you? Very proud, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. If, on the other hand, to be professors you don't need to be. But you don't have to know that to know, to survive as a student here but I, I'm so pleased to see his curiosity has her. gone beyond. Her. So pleased to see that her curiosity well, is... Yes, I mean, that was a very careful and comprehensive response. She no obviously, question. No question. You know, composed it very carefully, and that's, that's right. great. That's right. And carefulness and comprehensiveness is good for a career in medicine, don't you think? Absolutely. Yes. You bet. 
All right, let's do a few picks of the week. And Uh I'm going to start with you, Dixon. Well, we've got a book that we listed uh, for these four different kinds of fish that are in their own ways uh, endangered. And uh, What are they? Well, one of them is a salmon, right? One of them is a tuna. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the codfish, as I recall. Uh Uh-huh. And there's a fourth fish that I'm blocking on right now. And I'm Let's s- look it up. Sorry to say that I am because I love these fish. Who wrote the book? Uh, the name Paul of the Greenberg. author. That's right. That's right. And it's called Four Fish. I mean, there they are. Four Salmon. fish. Salmon. Right. They're, the pictures are over there. Oh, you know Thanks. what they are from the picture? Sure. Oh, let's see if Dixon can tell. Come on, okay. what do we got okay. here? Okay, the bottom one is the codfish. Great, what's this? The next one is the salmon. No, that's not a salmon. This is a tuna, though. That's the tuna. That's the salmon at the top. The third fish. Rake. Salmon, bass, tuna, and cod. Bass. What? Oh, yeah, they got their names right next right to them. Right there. <laughs> no, no, I can't read that, so I'm <laughs> I'm going by shapes only. The, the yeah. world's dominant wild-caught and farmed fish. What kind of bass is that? Just You're the bad. fisherman. No, you I'm not. A... <laughs> now, I should know that. I like to fish for bass. Um, that doesn't look that like a bass. A, that looks like a smallmouth, uh, maybe. No, I, I, I would disagree with you there, Alan. Um, <laughs> I need my glasses. Where the heck are my yeah, glasses? These. These oh, are yeah, mag- yeah, these yeah are magnifying glasses. Come on, guys. <laughs> Let's get this over here. Uh, you know what that is? That's a Chilean sea bass. Delicious. That's oh. what I think. Oh. A Chilean mm-hmm. Sea bass. Sea okay. bass, and they're busy extincting it. Yes. And that same thing happened with orange ruffy. I don't know if you remember the, the rush for orange ruffy at restaurants. It's only found in one place off the coast of New Zealand, and it's the primary food for the giant squid. I see. And it's, there's a sea mound that's like hundreds of miles in diameter, mm-hmm. and over this sea mound you can find the world's population of orange ruffy. And they almost extincted them, selling them to the restaurants. And then, of course, they discovered they were running short of, of orange ruffy, so they started to switch to Chilean sea bass. <laughs> so these are all wild fish that are being they were they were out. The, well the bluefin tuna, of course, is, a, is right. one of the biggest victims of uh, the sushi connoisseurs of the world. Right? Uh, they've successfully farm raised salmon, but it's just not the same as if you caught a wild salmon and ate it. Everybody knows this, and the codfish. Henry Hudson, when he first came to this part of the world, claimed that he had a very difficult time coming into shore with his boats because he had to row against the backs of all of the spawning codfish. That's how many there were. And today, of course, uh, it's hard to find a codfish. So this book is about... That's the fish that built Massachusetts. There you go. There you go. There's so, a giant wooden one hanging in the legislature. It's oh, yeah, because it, otherwise you'll forget what they look like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, you can't catch them in the Atlantic anymore. It's illegal. That's right. And the stocks just went downhill altogether. So we're good at extincting things and uh, you know exploiting resources that are limited. And that's what this book is all about. That's cool. That's a nice book. Someday I'm going to write The Future of the Last Wild Viruses. There you go. <laughs> it's going to be a long time from now, don't you think? <laughs> well, yes. if their hosts disappear, of course, then the virus is going I like this. I'll bet he goes into each fish and it's he history. Does. Oh, that's great. He I does. think it's a great idea. I'm yeah, going to yeah. buy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dixon. That's beautiful. You're welcome. Alan, what do you got? What do you uh, have? Well, this Sorry. was a pick of the week about a year ago, I think, but uh, they just had the contest again and announced the winners, and oh. I am a sucker for beautiful pictures. Boy, so I'll tell you, this is great. It is this year's the 2010 winners of the Nikon Small ah. World. Contest. That's the fab, that's the best. That is and the best. And this is this is the microscopic imaging contest. Olympus also runs one that the, those have been quite impressive. But these just every year I just <laughs> spend a while on this site browsing them and and just it yeah. blows my mind. Wow, and all, the, all the fluorochromes of these. Yeah, you know the use of fluorochromes. I mean, uh, Marty Chaffee must be quelling, as they would say, with the use of all of these fluorescent uh, probes Gorgeous. because. It's fantastic. It's it's fabulous stuff. Right. They're not all fluorescent images, though. No, no, Some no. Of you're right. Just, are just you're right. very well composed traditional microscopy and, yeah. and just this stunning one. stuff. This is great first stuff. Place, Thank you, Alan. This here, here. First place oh is God. the heart of Anopheles Gambia. Look at yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not sure that's first place. I, you know, there's there's some <laughs> awfully good stuff here. 
Yeah, these are beautiful. It's amazing. They're outstanding. The honorable mentions are awesome. But yeah. it's why we were attracted to science, too, right? Something beautiful about it uh, strikes us. Hey, is this a worm of some kind, Dick? Uh, I don't know. Click on it. Let's see there. Uh, it takes too long to load. <laughs> <laughs> They're big images. That's true. Claire Hovig. These are scientists, largely, right? Oh, man. Hey, Anas Anasakis pergrephi, a parasitic worm. Do you know Anasakis. I know about Anasakis. Sure, they, 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 they affect and infect cetaceans. This is oh. what you get if you eat sushi that hasn't been flash frozen. Uh, I see. Because the whales poop this out and then That's the fish right. eat it, right? We discussed I remember that. that. We did a little Dixon, talk on I this. I listen to you, except when I'm sleeping. You don't just listen to me, Vince. You understand. I mean, you're... you're <laughs> You're an A number one student, I have to tell you. And you're also a great instructor, so that goes hand in hand. Unfortunately, I'm not getting graded. <laughs> I gave you an A. This is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Look at this fly head here. This is cool. There's tons of stuff out well, there. Alan, uh, thank you. Just go sure. check yes, it out. Yes, thank you. This That's is terrific. Cool. You know, we have the biggest part of our brains are our optic lobes. <laughs> so we like to see things. And Turbinate this... eyes of the male mayfly. That's Oh, the mayfly. Oh, yeah. Very oh, cool. yeah. All right, and that looks like some kind of plant, right? Looks like uh, the red, the red cabbage, or what is that called? Uh, red lettuce. Just click it. Let's Zebra check. fish olfactory bulbs. My God, ah. I thought it was a plant. <laughs> oh, you can actually do. You can do a slideshow of this. Yeah, um, it's very cool. It's nice. very cool. Do they have any viruses? They must. Because if gonna they have do, to look at all 120. Of them. <laughs> find it. We'll put it. Wait, up, uh, this looks like it might be a virus over here. Let's try that one. Plum. It's a plum. You see, at, at this magnification, you really can't tell what these are. And, the one thing uh, they have in common is that they're all beautiful. And we'll go through. If I find a virus, we'll put it as the uh, episode photo. Alan, nice. thank you thank so you. much sure. for picking it yeah, up. Yeah, thank you. That's great. And Rich Condit. Well, this is something I just ran across today as I was uh, researching one of the organisms that we were looking at. And it was a link through NCBI to a website that I hadn't seen before called uh, Encyclopedia of Life. Oh. And this looks like a kind of a, a wiki type operation oh, where yeah. they're using the whole world to uh, assemble yeah. an Encyclopedia of Life. I haven't looked at it too much, but what I've seen yeah. uh, uh, looks uh, really great. And so uh, anybody can uh, contribute and they also sign up uh, curators to sort of look at the stuff that uh, mm -hmm. comes in. And if Oh, look at that. Is that some sort of insect? Yeah. It looks like a weevil. Uh, yes, I'm looking at the white pine weevil that was featured on the front page. It is this a is cool. Yeah. This is so uh, you can click on any of these and they give you the whole right. taxonomy and then a yep. whole bunch of description about what it is and, and I think E.O. Wilson's um behind this one, by the way. Yes. And they, they want uh, to barcode every single species. Yeah. And they want to they want a catalog of what's out there. Right. Gentlemen. Yeah, he's, you've got a quote from him up in the top here. Imagine uh, an electronic page for each species that's right. of organism on Earth. Correct. Correct. That's gentlemen, a great idea. Gentlemen, there are viruses in this encyclopedia there have of to, life. Yes, there has there must to be. Oh, because then there yeah. must be life forms, then, right? <laughs> you know, I've, I've come to feel that the virion is not living, but the infected cell is. Because uh -huh. the virion is just a particle, but the cell that's infected is living, right? Absolutely. I'll buy that. Sure. Okay. That's cool. Good. I like and, that. And I'm I was just thrilled to discover that uh, the species that's named after my family, the tech, taxonomists have actually apparently agreed on a, a different um, naming for it. It had several names. So uh, what's that? So what is it now? Uh, Culicoides dovey. Culicoides. Yes. I bet you it's a vector for something. Like it, it. So it, they got a picture out in here. It's a biting midge. Sure. Uh, but the it's it had several names. It was discovered independently by a few folks. Culicoides furens is the uh, um, the one that apparently is the official name. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm I'm kind of glad of that because I was never particularly thrilled about having a <laughs> a, a biting midge named. Uh, they also have uh, <laughs> doves' long fin herring here. They well, do. no, that one in particular was actually my grandfather. How do I how do I spell no, it? Right. <laughs> yes. Really? How do Alan. I spell this? I need to look this up. That's fabulous. Culicoides D O V D O V E I. And they also have Paracromus. He, he discovered Duffy. it on the uh, on a project he was working on in North Carolina, and oh, there it is. They got a picture and everything. Look at you. Which one? The the Culicoides. Dove, Culicoides. The dove, dove's long fin herring. Or Culicoides. That's Culicoides. They've got a, a nice drawing of it. Biting midge. 
Yes. Because you have the herring here. You All know, the culicoides are biting. Dove's long fin herring. Is that your grandfather? No, no, no. He was only only the biting midge. Okay. Alan is I, a I remarkable... I wouldn't mind having a, a, you know, a nice fish named after us or something. <laughs> Common it, name is the little gray punky. That's yes. right. It goes through everything. Uh, no seams. They also call them no seams. Yep. Uh, my first job here ever as a technician was to photograph the wings of culicoides for taxonomic purposes. Cool. That's how I learned darkroom photography. Well, my pick is uh, actually was suggested on Twitter by Windsurfer. He sent it to me, and it is the first all-digital science textbook that will be free. Wow. And it's an article by Wired in Wired magazine, mm -hmm. and it describes this um, textbook. And I thought it's an interesting concept, so everyone should have a look. They have the first... Um, section which is already up here it's it's actually funded by the eo wilson biodiversity foundation which we've just been talking about right first chapter is available first sentence of this article science textbooks are born as clunky out-of-date tomes the moment they roll off the printing press <laughs> and i didn't quite like that <laughs> <laughs> having produced a clunky no no that's not right <laughs> well so why by the way <laughs> you know there, some of them are all out of date but mine isn't it's because yeah. if you write about principles that last uh, yeah, yeah. it's not going to be out of date i mean eventually it will be yes and i would love to have my textbook digital and i would love to give it away but that is not a viable publishing option. No. So I don't know how this is going to work, so you should read this and figure it out. It's a not-for-profit organization. The okay. video is impressive. The, uh, the, the con uh, conceptually, it's impressive. It would be uh, a really cool way to learn stuff. You bet. They can make this work. So I hope they can. I mean, students would love to have free textbooks. Of They'll course, sell advertisements and make it work. Uh, that might be working. You know, I'm, I'd love to participate in some kind of experiment. As when this. you look at when you look at the animations and stuff that they're putting into this, the, the amount of work is absolutely phenomenal. Well, digital right. lets you do that, right? Yeah, sure. Well, and this could get around um, also some major economic problems in the textbook industry. I mean, I'm thinking of of uh, high school textbooks, which yeah, yeah. are just a. I mean, they're a train wreck. the The industry yeah, is right. is um, controlled by a couple of textbook publishers who cater Correct. to pretty much the Texas Board of Education and the California Board of Education That's true. because those are the biggest markets. So those right. dictate, those two markets dictate what everybody gets in their science textbooks. Um, and if you had something like this that could be used as, a, as an alternative text and right. that was really a full-fledged proper science text and continuously updated, it uh, could really revolutionize the way science is taught at all levels. Sure. So the other pick has to be either a Kindle or an iPad. Yeah, they say hey, we've gone from the $1,000 laptop to a $500 iPad in no time at all. Well, look, someone will make money from this way of doing it. I think it's a better way. I don't have a problem with that. But to think that no one is going to profit is not correct. Someone will. And in fact, oh, and that's this, fine. I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with yeah. the people who produce writing making money off I of it. I guess you are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I, I think they ought to make more. It's the, uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. It, well, <laughs> what this would allow you to do is eliminate so many of the middlemen. Yeah, but this I also think that a, a, a textbook on a computer can have so much more than just words, right? You know so, what? But you can update this thing in a minute. Yeah, of course. There, there are many benefits. But, you know, this changes very slowly because yeah, there's this big publishing behemoth. There's a whole infrastructure right? built around a different way of doing yeah. business, and they're it's not going to go quietly into right. the night. And my kids get books, you know, from their school. They have a big investment, and they should be handing them a little pad that has everything they need on it, right? Yep. Or a disc. And taking it back <laughs> at the end of the year. But sure. So this is an interesting thing to get some ideas from. So that's Interesting. By the way, I, I once uh, was privileged to spend a week at Wake Forest University as a visiting scholar about three years ago. And uh, just before I retired, and I learned there that every student is handed a laptop as they go into school, yeah. and it's got all four years of every course online, and you can access any of it. You can get the syllabus, you can get the reading list, you can get the lessons for the day, and then at the end of the four years, you hand it back to them. Mm. At which point it has no resale value whatsoever. That's absolutely correct, and then they upgrade them, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, but it's a remarkable service. I mean, of course, they pay through it through their tuition. But uh, it's a heck of a thing to have standardization at some level so that every student can learn about what every other student is learning if they wanted. Mm -hmm. I like that. I can't imagine having 
my lectures for the next four years all ready to go. Well, no, as you give them, I think you have to do it year by year by year. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's for the four years of college. Right. That's what I meant. Not not that you should have yours ready four right. years in advance. But uh, Well, we'll see where it goes. It's going to be interesting. We will. Right? We will. We will. Well, there are many ways to listen to Twiv. You don't have to read a book, right? Nope. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace, <laughs> or you can go to twiv.tv and listen, download, get all the great links that we post, the letters, and also, what else? Weekly Picks. The we weekly have everything picks. there. They're all Where there. you can also listen with the Microbe World app, which you can find at microbeworld.org. It's for your iPhone or iPad. Check it out. And as always, we'd love to hear your questions and comments, even though we're way behind. We'll have to do a all email show sometime soon this fall, and uh, that will do it. Dixon de Pommier can be found at verticalfarm.org and at better bookstores near you. Signing his book. <laughs> what happens if they buy a digital copy? They can't get your signature. I could actually send that to them by email if they'd like me to. Of course, <laughs> I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> Yesterday, Dixon spoke with Brian Lehrer on NPR, and you can we'll put a link to that show. <laughs> You have been on NPR three times, I found, by searching for that. Brian Lear. Did you like Brian Lear? I loved him. In fact, I was I was one of his instructors. He's got a master's in public health from Columbia wow. University. So when so, I walked into uh, his studio, he says, you know, I, I had you in a course. Oh, you, you went to the studio. <laughs> yeah. And I said, mm -hmm. and you still agreed to have me on your show? <laughs> <laughs> and you spoke into a microphone? I did. What kind? Uh, it was an interesting microphone. It was covered with a cloth yeah. so that you couldn't hear my heavy breathing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tried to get you one of those, but that's and, well, all I could afford. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I'll, I'll try to come up with something better that's okay. next time. <laughs> that's okay. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thanks, Alan. Always a pleasure. Uh, great to hear from you, Alan. Yeah. Good and to hear from you. You too, Dixon. I forgot to say, yes, we're no, glad to have I'm, you back. I'm visit thrilled. more often. I, it's not a visit. I'm... I'm you neglectful. give, you give it dynamism to the show. Oh, stop it. I'll cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> and Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, which has become the home of the lame gators. Uh, it's, it, unfortunately, it is a rebuilding year. They I'm cut afraid. that tail off the gator. Uh, that's right. <laughs> can't be on top every year. The, the gator's tail is between its legs. <laughs> you know. that's right. It's okay. We'll come back. You guys will. We'll You're darn right. Darn yeah. right. That's all right. So great to be here. Great to have everybody together. That's yeah. fun. Feels it's like good. a family. And I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can read what I write at Virology Blog, which is virology.ws. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>